State of the Nation with Zororo Makamba. The sanctions debate, it just won't go away. It's a debate that Zimbabwe has had for almost two decades now. There have been marches, there have been petitions, there have been excuses and denials. Now on one side, some say sanctions are the cause of all of our problems. On the other side, some say there are no sanctions. So what is the truth and what is the lie? Let's find out on this week's State of the Nation. Now there have been different types of sanctions placed on Zimbabwe over the years. Let's start in Europe. In 2002, Zimbabwe held elections. Now, ahead of that election, the EU sent observers, but Zimbabwe kicked out the head of that election observer team. So in February 2002, the EU placed what they called targeted or restrictive measures on Zimbabwe. What were these measures? One, at least 20 government officials were banned from Europe. Number two, no more EU money going to the government. There was 128 million euros that had been budgeted for the Zim government from 2002 to 2007. This was cancelled. But there's one important thing. While the EU stopped funding the Zim government directly, it kept sending money to Zimbabwe, but only through aid agencies and NGOs. What's the position now? Well, over the past few years, the EU and Zimbabwe have kind of mended the fences a bit. A lot of the EU sanctions are gone. Only the late president Mugabe and his wife remained on the list. Still, the EU doesn't give Zimbabwe money. The government still channels money through NGOs. We saw this during the recent cyclone Idai. That's the EU. But let's go to the sanctions that raise the most debate. The US sanctions. Now, it gets a bit complicated here, so pay attention. There are two types of US sanctions on Zimbabwe. You've heard of the first one, Zidera. This started in 2001. Then there's also what the US calls the Targeted Sanctions Program. This started in 2003. Under the Targeted Sanctions Program, there are companies and people that are on the sanctions list. US companies are not allowed to deal with them. More on this a bit later. But let's start with Zidera. That's the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act. This law made several demands. One, Zimbabwe must respect human rights. Two, Zimbabwe must get out of the DRC. Remember 1998, together with several other Saudi countries, we sent the army into the Congo to fight against the rebels there. Number three, Zidera demanded an end to the takeover of white farms. Now, if none of these demands were met, the US would not allow the likes of the IMF or the World Bank to give us any money or to forgive our debts. Remember, the US controls these institutions. What it says, goes. Now, stay with us here. There have been two other versions of Zidera. We've told you about the first one in 2001, but a new Zidera came into effect in 2018. This was just before last year's elections. Now, what did this one say? Restore democracy or we can't be friends. Easy, right? Why can't Zimbabwe just do these reforms? Isn't free elections, free media, and human rights the kind of stuff that's in our constitution already? It is, and it is true. We need these reforms. They must happen. But let's look at the other demands. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. One of the major demands of Zadera is this. Enforce the ruling of the Sadiq Tribunal. What exactly is the Sadiq Tribunal and why is it such a big deal? Here's the backstory. In 2007, a group of white farmers went to a special regional court called the Sadiq Tribunal. Here's what the tribunal said. Number one, the land reform exercise was racially motivated. This means it violates our constitution. And it means that the whole land reform was pretty much illegal. It must be reversed. The farmers must get their land back. Number two, the tribunal said that the farmers must be compensated for the land. But here's the problem. Under our constitution, under section 295, Zimbabwe only pays compensation for improvements on the land, not the land itself. And another thing, Zimbabwe just doesn't have the money. How much do the farmers want? About 9 billion US dollars. In fact, some of the farmers want as much as 30 billion US dollars. That's more than the GDP of our whole country. And that's why it's hard to comply with all the Zidera demands. The Zim government has put up $53 million to pay some of these needy farmers. That's all there is right now. 9 billion? Not gonna happen. So, now that we know what sanctions we have, what is the impact? US companies can't deal with government companies on the sanctions list. Here's a real example. We have the Industrial Development Corporation, the IDC. It's a state company that has shares in companies like Olivine and the Zimbabwe Fertilizer Company. The IDC used to be on the US sanctions list. In 2016, these companies got money from outside the country to fix their factories. The money was frozen by the US. Because of sanctions, it's really hard to move money into Zimbabwe. Why? Because banks can be fined for dealing with sanctioned countries. 
Standard Chartered Bank had to close IDC's bank accounts. The banks were scared of these fines. And this actually went down. In April 2019, America fined the bank 18 million US dollars for dealing with sanctioned companies. Now they're not alone. CPZ also got a fine of 385 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. What's the impact? Well, international banks just stopped blending and dealing with Zimbabwe. Nobody wants the drama. Does this affect us? Of course. Here's how. Banks around the world work together under what's called correspondent banking relationships. For example, when you use your card in one country, the local bank uses its relationship with the bank in another country to clear the transaction. That's how people are able to buy and sell goods across borders. Now, but because banks are scared of getting caught up in our beef with the US, they just say, hey, you know what? Count us out. So they cut us off. They cut off Zimbabwean banks. According to the RBZ, Zimbabwe has lost over 100 such relationships over the past decade. That's a lot. This is why we saw a Chinese bank recently saying, hey, we're not going to deal with Zim. And for private companies in Zimbabwe, it's very hard to get loans from outside the country. If they do get the money, it's very expensive. They call it high risk premium. Even one of the guys behind Zidera says this. Here's what US Senator Chris Kuhn said in June last year. It makes it harder for them to access capital. For the government, it gets a lot harder to borrow the money we need for big projects. Debt relief gets harder too. So now we know what sanctions on Zimbabwe look like. What is Zimbabwe doing about all of this? We hear a lot of talk that our problems are all because of sanctions. If only you remove the sanctions, things will be okay. Here's what the president recently said. He said this, yes, we want sanctions gone, but we can't sit back and do nothing. We have to find ways around them. So what's being done? Laws such as IPA and POSA are being replaced. This has to happen, not because the US wants that, because Zimbabweans want that. Government is going ahead with re-engagement. It looks really tough right now, but it has to be done. This is why Finance Minister Mtuli Mube is talking to G7 countries about our debts. That's why the IMF staff monitored program is so important. And we're pushing to make our old friendships work a bit better. We've talked a lot about the Look East policy. It's time to make it work. Outside old friends like China, we're seeing Zimbabwe make more links with countries in the Gulf and in other states. Are sanctions the cause of all of our problems? No. We've got our own issues, like corruption. We've talked about this before on the show. But are the sanctions real? Yes, it's a fact. Do they affect the economy? Yes, they do. But what's more important is what we do about them. Sanctions are real, and we need real solutions.